All right, so coach, first of all, we are comparing spread offense to pro style or pro offense tight ends and split outs and wings and all the things. So when we're looking at the pistol power offense, I kind of put that in that realm, right? We have a tight end. We have a wing that can move around all over the place. Um, we got wide receivers split out. So let's just start benefits here. What are the benefits of, of the spread offense? Yeah. Uh, do you want to let me share the screen so I can uh, show a little, little, little of course here. I allow you to, to, we love to, to be able to appreciate being allowed to, there you go. All right. Go. Okay. Um, so you yeah, at the top, we got a pro style at the bottom. We got a spread. I mean, they're just lined up against the four, two, five. This is not anything revolutionary here that we're looking at by any means. Um, one of the things, the, the difference in the spread and the pro style, as Tommy said in chat, you know, we do both. We do both, you know, so Pistol power offense is a pro style offense, but we line up and spread a lot. And in fact, we line up more in spread this past year than, than anything else. We probably ran uh, zone read speed option, you know, by the end of the year, those were a base plays. Um, so what we're talking about more is the philosophy behind one or the other. And with the spread philosophy, it's very much, um, the width of the field at 53 and a third and using, forcing you to defend all 53 and a third yards across the field, uh, spreading you out because the hardest thing to do in football is to um, tackle a good athlete in space. It, it really is the hardest thing to do. And a lot of defenses have not adapted to that. Uh, a lot of defenses have not adapted to that spread style um, some, you know, different areas, different things, but right. You know, the, 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 the idea is to spread you out and, you know, count the box. If I get, you know, if I get a five man box, then I got five, you know, I got five linemen for your five guys. So if you start putting guys out over top of all my, um, receivers, uh, you know, I'm just going to hand the ball off and run it. If, if you go balanced, we'll figure it out. You know, usually with you balanced, we can try to run. We still run it. We can read somebody um, to even it up as well, which gets you back to an advantage. Uh, and then you can also, um, you know, from your, you know, get if, if they try to pack the box, play man on you, then you try to do some passing. And, and the whole philosophy um, is to, is to really just stretch you out and just just you know make it hard for you to defend all of that space. Um, I I think you, what you said big time is about like people haven't adapted to the full spread, and that's because the other nine teams on their on on their schedule are running a pro version, the running wing T, the running uh, double wing. Um, they're just not running spread, right? Like that's, that is such a big, I mean, you, they probably have a trips check in, but it's one. <laughs> yeah. And, and doubles may, may, uh, their backside may get some extra work, right? The weak side, they don't, they don't, may not know how to play it as well, but I just, I also see a lot of teams that just aren't effectively using the, the spread philosophy. So they'll line up in a spread and just, and, and, I'm one of the things that, you know, I won't be the offensive coordinator this year. Um, so I'm doing like part-time deal, but if, if, if I had continued calling the plays, I would have had to spend more time uh, studying and, and changing my thinking to the spread philosophy, because that's not my philosophy. It just, you know, within the pistol power offense, spreading it out kind of started to help our athletes and it fit some of the athletes that we had. And it was going to be even more so, uh, you know, I don't know what it looks like for, you know, as far as a tight end, like we can always find a tight end and, and our tight end is actually coming back. Um, but I think he may end up in a different position. Tight end may not be the best use of his abilities if, if he continues to develop. Um, I would have had to to change my play calling somewhat uh, or my thought process 
And what I see a lot is I see coaches lining up in two by two, let's say, and essentially hoping you go out there because they really can't, you know, they're, they're outside of maybe a bubble. They really struggle to truly spread the field right. and to attack the weaknesses. Uh, and and my my base play calling thought process, which is a numbers game, uh, you know, that's my big thing is where can I get numbers angles, uh, you know, with you in your defense lined up. The spread definitely looks at numbers, but you have to be able to um, – to use it, I guess. And I, so, yeah, we got teams on the schedule that run a wing T. Yeah, we got teams that run, you know, a pro style or whatever. We got spread teams, too, that don't stretch us the way that a spread offense should. Um, what about the pro style offense or, or pro offense? What what um, are the benefits there? Like, why, why do I need to run that? Yeah, I mean – we're going to they, they, we're going to come at you. Uh, it's still the same type of thing because I always think we're going to take what what you give us, and you know there's differences in pro style. Like okay, you know our one back offense, which is what you know we're a one back offense, pro style one back. There's differences between that and a pro style I formation. Because a pro style, even though we can line up at an eye and do all that, a pro style eye formation based offense is going to come right at you. Just like in the spread, there is spread to run and teams that can spread to pass. So there's a big difference between an air raid spread and uh, say a spread option. And there's a, there's a huge difference in those, but the formational thought process remains the same. The formational thought process in pro style is is really setting it up to run. Um, we want to see the tight end today, a good blocking tight end, not in a wing T, because wing T tight ends tend to be down blocks, right? Yep. There are a lot of down blocks. Our tight end is zone blocking. He's base blocking. He's, you know, he's doing a lot of stuff. Um, reach blocking more so than the, the – we want to see how you're going to handle that tight end. If I think that if I can stress you, it's really – I've never thought about, like, what's the, what's the philosophy of it? You know, how does it differ? But the tight end is really a major part of this because a lot of our base runs are off tackle – in that C gap area and how are you handling that? What are you, what is your answer to a good blocking tight end? Uh, and at times a good blocking H back too. We can extend the edge even more. We can run it the other way, depending on who the H back is. Um, but, but, you know, the offense is much more balanced um, spread. Like I said, a lot of spreads are spread to run or spread to throw. Uh, and ideally, they're going to be able to uh, attack you both ways. We can be heavy run based, but we're not going to be as good. We've got to be able to throw the ball. We have a lot more play action. Um, we have a lot more play action in the offense to to where, you know, you're trying to line up to defend the run and, and pro style in general uh, is going to be a lot more play action. Uh, quick game passing is probably equal. Uh, in terms of how much we use that we don't do a lot of option football in our base set we can you know obviously we can get in spread and do option we have a couple of little option double reads that we can use but anything like zone read speed option we're getting into a spread for that so it's not a good option based set um but man it is definitely really built around the tight end majorly and then to to an extent the h back and a, and a pro I, which is still a pro offense, but a pro I is a little bit different than when we talk about pro style, uh, you know, one back. 
a pro eye is really built around pounding you with that tailback. And it's a tailback feature offense. And we're not a running back feature offense. Right. Um, <clears throat> I like tight ends because we see a lot of 3-4 and 5-2 right now. And I feel like just bringing a tight end to a game makes you makes you put four people on the line. Or I'm going to have the advantage. It's your choice. But now I'm making you do something you obviously don't want to do because you picked a, a three front off or defense for a reason, right? So um, maybe the bubbles inside are a little different. Uh, maybe whatever the issue is. But what I like to know is that I can make your force player, who you thought was going to be your outside linebacker playing force, come down and at least put a two-point stance on top of a tight end. And now that safety, strong safety, whoever was on top of him, who thought he was going to go back and play, you know, some cover three, some cover two, whatever, um, he's now got to come down and play force. So I'm going to take your guys and make them do something you didn't want them to do or they don't want to do, whatever whatever the reasoning was. Um that's why I love a forefront because we're just ready for everything. If you want to go two by two, that's great. If you want to come down and put a tight end in the box, great. Uh, I mean, the four two five struggles about, you know, one play against a, a double tight, and then we'll figure out what you're actually trying to do with that, and we'll we'll manage there too. So, um, I, I think really, the, I uh, you know, I, this is not a defensive podcast, but I, we've talked before, and you've talked about how much five two you're seeing, and I'm seeing it too. I really don't get it. And I know. <laughs> I, I mean. I, I've run everything, but I really don't get it. I don't, I don't, I, I do not get this like abandonment of even fronts. And it's, I really think that there is, a, I don't want to say a lack of understanding because that's like, you know, that that's kind of insulting to the, to these, to an odd front coach. And I don't mean it to be that way, but I, I guess what I do mean is this, and you know, this from the even front perspective, my guys, at least three out of the four, and if you don't use a tight end, four out of the four defensive linemen are always doing the same thing. They are playing from an outside shade. And if you don't use a tight end, and all four of those guys are lining up in an outside shade. And I can, you know, we do some G front, some inside shades here and there, but the base defense, they are playing from an outside shade every single snap. And so they're squeezing down blocks, spilling, and I just think it is more effective in a lot of cases because it is so much easier. Yep. Uh, and I just don't understand the, you know, I, old school coaches, I don't think it's like old school coaches were like, you got to have somebody over top of the tight end. That, you know, that's not necessarily a reason to choose your defense, right? Because you might only see one three weeks out of the year or something like that. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm 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 big on the even front, and not because it's better, uh, but because it's simple. It's just so simple. Um, and, and we talked about the four three is not simple because of the coverage behind it, especially, but also the two gap. But the, really, the coverage uh, because it does not work well with like a cover three. It, it really works ideally with the quarters coverage, and otherwise the numbers get get icky. And um, but the simplicity of the four three is that all four defensive linemen and four, three are always outside shade. And no matter what, killing it and killing it. And that's what they want to do. Yep. Um, that's the only thing on a four, two, five, right. Is my strong end has to know how to play head up on a tight end. He might be getting a block. He might be trying to just stuff him for, before he goes out on a route, like. Yep. Screen. We simplify that by just saying like, if you don't have a kid who can handle that, you just play him in a six eye inside shade. And, you know, you go from there. Yeah, that simplifies it a lot. You just stick his button C gap because ultimately that's his job. He doesn't have to play head up. Um, and we don't even play him head up. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and and along those lines, I think both offenses, different plays, and I guess we, if we want to get into the plays that you're going to see in these formations and the things that people want to do out of them, uh, I think the spread, the good spread teams, not all of them, because I know, you know, I. I know Kevin Kelly won a, a hell of a lot of games, right? And and he ran like 10,000 plays. But most of these come from uh, kind of like, I think Urban Meyer, when really when when they started doing this at Utah, was 
along these lines. And that's where the tree kind of, you know, that, that was a lot of what was going on. Um, I think Chip Kelly with the, you know, going so fast made this a thing too. I think the spread does a really good job. The good spread coaches do a really good job of saying like, Hey, look, we got five plays and that's it. And they don't use a lot of them don't use motion. They don't use, you know, like 10 personnel, a little bit of empty, but like they're lined up two by two, three by one. And they're running, you know, whatever zone read, power read, speed option. They got three plays, and it's like they're just gonna make you wrong, right? Yeah, I mean, and they're and, the and, the day, and they're gonna put, and it's almost like a, a spread out wing tee type, type of concept. Somebody's gonna be in in conflict. Somebody's gonna be wrong, yeah. uh, and then when you get in there because you're wrong no matter what because we're reading one of those guys, and the only way for you to match the numbers to bring another guy in, well, now as long as we can pass the ball a little bit then we can survive. And that's kind of the spread option philosophy and the air raid philosophy does the same thing. And maybe even better in that a lot of air raid coaches are pulling like three passing concepts. Uh, and I remember Chris Hatcher years ago, uh, you know, talking about the air raid uh, Valdosta state and he had five passing concepts and they were winning national championships. Uh, and then he went to Georgia Southern with it. I think they had five, you know, Y corner and Y sale and, um, mesh and uh uh you know hitches all hitches and stuff and uh you know he had like five concepts that he was really focused on he had a couple screens and he ran inside zone and like one run play and uh it was like you know essentially you know five six seven plays and that's it and the spread what I like about, again, what I like about coaches that are really focused in on the spread concept is the idea that we can look at your numbers and we can run one of these five plays, six plays, seven plays, because somewhere on the field, you don't have that 53 and a third. You don't have all 53 and a third defended. Somewhere out there is a spot. So, yeah, when I think of spread, like you said, if we're going to spread it out, I know what I'm going to get. When I watch film, I know exactly what you're going to give me week in and week out because someone else has ran at least a touch of this. They've thrown trips at you, trips nub, trips detached, two by two, whatever. So I can pretty much read what you're doing as a defense and I can bring out those beaters and that's the plays we practice that week and I go out and execute. If you happen to have one of those plays, you're handling it pretty well, fine. We'll use the other one or the other two. Um... And I feel like that would be a weakness going against a spread is that we don't, like I said earlier, not a lot of teams are running it. So you're continuously going to see defenses that aren't prepared for you. Yeah. Where if you go to the tight end side, you talked about just now, you know, using that space. Um, the hashes are so darn wide in high school that the edge, like if I can just go to get a tight end of the field and use him as that additional blocker, especially start talking about running an H over there as well. If I have that feature back, or a running quarterback, whatever it happens to be, or a slot that I can run in jet or however, I just can get the edge on you so quick. And there's so much room, so much room. So I think they both have benefits in high school um, based on the time we have allowed and the size of the field, really. Yep. And I think uh, along the, the pro style, uh, more so than the spread, we talked about the spread trying to, you know, just use – two formations basically and find where your weakness is um pro style in, in the way that we do it is going to be a lot more on formations so we may only have five plays uh, you know we have five run plays we have a handful of passes we have, we have five drop back passes but we don't use them all every week or maybe mean, two or three in the playbook a right. um, couple play actions, as we said, screens and draws uh, is basically what's what's in the playbook. And uh, so in that regard, we're not very different. You know, plays, you can't run a ton of plays and really execute uh, most most of the time. Some teams can, but most can't. Sounds like um, it's um, Coach Simple, yeah, play fast win. I think yeah, there's a yeah, – yeah, yeah. Someone wrote a thing one time. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're going to use formations and we're going to try to break your defense. So the spread is, it's almost like a zone. I mean, it, it is a little bit of a zone versus a, a gap 
philosophy, even though the plays themselves might be zone or gap. You know, we run zone. Um, we run gap spread. Some spread teams run gap, you know, run dart and stuff like that, but run a trap, but um, a lot more zone schemes in the run game. But the philosophy behind zone is we're going to, if I'm running an inside zone, let's say you're going to create the hole. Your defense is going to create the hole because if you overflow, we're going to cut it back. If you don't, then we're going to go, we're going to cram it, all that sort of stuff. Your defense is telling us where we should run the ball in zone. Well, I think the spread philosophy has a lot of that going on when I'm only lining up in two by two, three by one. Your defense, your defensive alignment is going to tell us where to go. You want to put five in the box, we're going to hand it off. You want to put six in the box, we're going to do what we're best at. You want to put seven in the box, we're going to throw it. Um, you know, you're, we're going to read you and the quarterback's going to keep it or the, or the running back's going to uh, take it. And it's based on the read. And uh, it's the same thing in air rate. You know, passing is all basically option. I, it's like confuses people sometimes, but this is all option plays and passing. You, if that guy drops here, then I throw here. If he goes there, I throw here. It's all post snap reads, um, just like zone, just like option. But that's the philosophy of the spread with the formations too, is, I'll let you tell me where we should go or what we should run. And there's a little bit of that, um, but it's a lot more active in the pro style and that we're probably going to run between three and seven, I'd say formations in a given game. We, we like to use a lot of, uh, you know, some shifts and we use a lot of motion. Um, you know, we use the whole play clock and, the, we are trying to actively break your defense and find things that we can line up in that create a flaw in in your defensive alignment, uh, whether it's out leveraging you or just creating space or whatever it may be. Um, that's more of a gap scheme run game philosophy, which is we're going to run the ball off tackle. We're going to down block all these guys. We're going to kick that guy. We're going to wrap another guy up through the hole. And it's called power because we're just going to do what the frick we want. <laughs> and, you know, you're not going to stop us. And then if I can use formations to break your defense and then do that too, that's even better. Right. Uh, and we do it with, with zone. And so there's that philosophy, philosophical difference, I think. Uh, in the use of formations and in the use of um, in how we want and how we want to manipulate the defense, whether it is passively, like you decide, you tell us, and, you know, we're, we're going to be two by two. You decide what you want to do and, and where you want the ball to go. And we're fine with that because we're, because we're going to have a numbers advantage and space advantage right. compared to we're going to actively go out there, use formations, break your defense and then run where it's broken yep. or pass where it's broken. So um, weaknesses definitely have to talk weaknesses because you know, they do, that does exist. Um, so for when we're talking spread, you know, when I think of weaknesses, I think it's just that much, like I said earlier, we know what defense we're going to see. We know exactly what you're going to do on offense, especially if you come out and say, Hey, I've got five plays. I'm going to utilize them to beat what you're doing. But if I can run two coverages that are, you know, accentuate each other, if I can run a cover one, cover three, um, maybe some cover two in there. Now you don't know what I'm running. So how do you call a play against that when you don't have a formation to break my defense? So it's a, I feel like that's a guessing game for the spread game. Um, and then, you know, if all else fails, you just go man across the board and may the best uh, players win, which, I used to think that coaches went spread because they had the dudes, but after our episode with Ron, um, it opened my eyes to like, some people are doing it because they don't want a full box and their O-line isn't that great. And we can really lighten the box and try to try to alleviate that mismatch. And a lot of it is I got, I got, I got crappy kids, but at least if I can play a seven on, on seven, I can get you to seven on seven. Right. If you go straight man and you go run out over top of my four receivers, now we're at least down to a seven on seven game. And, and again, I can create a little more space that way. Yeah. Um, 
So what other weaknesses do you see with the spread offense besides? It's well, so, I mean, you have to look at so short simple. Well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, um, now a lot of spread offenses will have a secondary, something they can get into. Um, you know, the team that we play here, that's been spread for Tony Franklin system since 2005, I think, um, Dinwiddie. And I believe they still do it. It, it. it feels automatic. I'm sure there's a call coming in, but it's like, you know, it's coming. They know it's coming, but you, you don't have time to get guys on and off the field. They get to a third and one, you know, they just, they, they, they go straight to the line and they're generally, you know, they're not huddling, but they're not in a hurry. Right. Uh, they're check with me type stuff. Um, but they go straight to the line, freaking power eye formation. And they're, they're running quarterback sneak or something like that. But when I was at Ellsworth college, uh, 2009, we played, uh, I love the, I love Juco, uh, school names. We played North Dakota, uh, college of science and math or something like that. Math and science. I think, I think I got all that right. It was a long, long name. Um, we played them at Iowa Falls High School, which was our home field, the glory of Juco ball. You play on a lot of high school fields. Um, and it poured, it, it was, it was a monsoon. Uh, I was surprised that we played the game because, you know, that's their high, maybe it was late enough in the year that they weren't worried about losing it, <laughs> right. ruining their high school field. Um, we played in the rain. Two spread teams. Everybody was spread. Everybody. I mean, the whole league was spread. Other than, uh, other than, um, we played against Tony and East when he was at, um, uh, when he was at uh, Grand Rapids, and he was running a musky gun. He was running a, a flex bone option type look. But almost everybody else was spread, as far as I can remember. And uh, Georgia military might not have been. It's pouring. It's cold. Neither one of those teams knew how to get under center. It was laughable. The game ended 10 to nothing. We scored twice because we scored 10. I don't, and it's 10 to nothing. Like I have no idea how we kicked the field goal. Because literally, I remember <laughs> I got there in July and we went and like got a kicker from like, you know, Ames or something. It was just like a kid who hadn't, hadn't signed on anywhere. And we were like, please come kick for us. We didn't have a kicker. Um, I, so I have no idea how we got three, but we, you know, we, we did. And, um, are you sure it wasn't like a two point conversion and a safety? It could have been. I don't remember. I mean, it was so cold. Like, I don't, I don't even remember what was going on. I don't remember. I'd love to, I, I'm sure I have the film on a DVD somewhere. Uh, if you can see, I don't, you probably can't see anything. I mean, it's probably just terrible, but uh, I don't remember. The, neither team could get under center. And so it was just, for us, the quarterback just needed to catch the snap because he was the best athlete on that field. He ended up being, I think, a final at Walter Payton finalist uh, at, at Northern Iowa. And uh, so we just had to get the ball in his hands. And, like, you know, it's one of those things where a fumbled snap might be his best play. Right. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't remember how we scored, but I imagine it was Randy getting loose up the middle or something like that. And um, that, you know, not having that short yardage you, you've got to add that in. And of course, now that's adding into the things that you need to teach is you do want to have a short yardage. Um, you do want to have some way to get under center or, you know, run some, run something. You got to have a plan for when it's crappy weather. You got to have a plan for when it's, you know, just, you just need to get in there and pound it. You got to have something to do that. So I think you're probably going to need to add something in uh, to the offense that we don't in a pro style have to add in because like I said it's a balanced offense right if if we need to run the ball we can run the ball if we need to throw the ball we can throw the ball uh the spread has the advantage of uh you know being able to play from behind a little bit better than some of the other ones but the um the ability to uh, to get under center or something and, and do a short yardage. Uh, Kyle mentioned in the chat about the weakness of uh, the allocation as a weakness and, and the spread teams need a wide receiver coach, uh, which you don't need in some other places. I mean, we need receivers, sure. But yeah, he's a flex bone, wing T. You might be able to get away without that. 
um, not just in coaches, but those four guys have to be some level of a threat. What a lot of times when we go and do a, see a spread, it's like the first thing that we're looking at game planning wise, because high school, because, and, and maybe this is why Daniel, you and I don't see as much spread as they do at higher levels. I'm going to look at your spread and I'm going to see your four receivers out there and I'm going to figure out which one I can ignore. Right. Cause when you've got 25 kids on the team, one of them's got to be a quarterback. One of them's got to be a running back. You're running out of athletes. Very fast. Yeah. Very fast. I can have a, a, a lineman playing Y or H and then substitute him for a kid who can be a, a decent threat, uh, you know, at receiver on third down if I want to. It could be – if you don't have four guys that can threaten, I think it's difficult. Yeah. I mean, literally, just ignore one of them. Um, when we move to the pro style or pro pro look offense, I I think the immediate weakness is kind of what you just it's personnel, and that is small schools. And this is why it blows my mind that every one A coach wants to run the wing tee. It absolutely blows my mind. But um, it's hard enough to find five guys to play O line, and now I need a sixth guy who's supposed to be good O line. Mm-hmm. but also can run some routes and catch a ball. And if I have an H back that's in the game, he also is now a seventh guy that I have to find that can block well enough um, that that I can rely on him to help break a play open, right? Because like you said, it's generally gap scheme. We get to a lot of power, which means I picked the gap I want to run. And when you put too many people there, what are we going to do? And so that is rely on the lowest level of skill of the the seven dudes up front trying to block it um and i feel like that's a huge risk it i mean just last year you know we had <laughs> we went down to south central oklahoma to ada and they had a defensive tackle that blew up our right tackle and the pulling guard put them both picked them up put them in the backfield and tackled the running back for a loss of two on buck like what do you Right. We didn't have enough people to run that. Had we been more spread out, and in fact, we we did. We were very multiple, and I think we had more success spread out because of the personnel we needed run and block, you know, to, to yeah. block up front. So when you start relying on kids and now he's your fourth or fifth offensive lineman or your sixth or whatever you're doing for that tight end guy, um, I really feel like that has to be a weakness you need to think about. Um of course, there's a hundred years of football of coaches running wing tee when they have absolutely no one on the team because it's a whole bunch of down blocks and a kick out and let's see what we can get. But I don't know. I, I see that as a weakness. There's definitely a big concern from coaches, and this is what's driven a lot of coaches to the spread that I can't that that which I always think this is funny, uh that there just aren't tight end kids. Um what I have had success and my schools have had success doing is, and this is this is a couple times that we've done, this is hard to do, by the way. But I think if you do this, you're going to find out that this was the right move. You, you only got five linemen. If you got another chubby kid or two around there, you got you to gotta work on coaching them. And you take the most athletic of those five linemen and you make him your why. And because remember, you are an off tackle based right game. And I can take a smaller kid and have him do a lot of down blocking and pulling from the guard position. And I can just try to destroy you in the off tackle with a why that's going to match up on a defensive end who in areas that see a lot of spread, he doesn't know how to play on tight end, right? right? Or I can get you in your odd front, like you talked about, and I can make that an advantage. Yes, it is difficult to find an H and a Y that um, it is difficult to find those guys that can get out there and they can block outside zone, they can block inside zone, they can down block. The H can kick out. They can learn all of those skills. And then they can also catch a seam route, catch an out route, 
Uh, they can also catch a, a ball in the flat on curl. So they have a, a threat as a receiver because we, we run into the same issue in years where I've had, I mean, one year I had an H. God bless him. He wasn't a threat. You know, he was a great blocker. He was a great kid. The other three kids were all all state. Uh, one of them was all state that year, and the other two were all state the following year. Uh, between my Y, Y X Y and Z, uh, the H was a was a tough kid, and he was probably one of the best blockers that I've had at that position consistently down in and down out. But some of his catches were just uncovered. You know, I think he had like four catches, and he was just like uncovered. It was like sometimes they just they would they would be like now. If they ignored him, he could catch the ball and he could, you know, he could do something. But they knew we weren't trying to throw the ball to him. Like, right. It, it was not – that was not the plan. Um, so you run into that issue for sure. Uh, I think that the spread maybe allows – now, here's what I don't think is a weakness. I don't, I don't believe – the basketball on grass thing. Maybe that was a thing at one time, but the, the the weakness that somebody would present to you is, yeah, your wing T, your pro I, your pro, your one back, tight ends and H backs and running the football and three yards in a cloud of dust. That's not us, by the way. Um, you know, but that's what the thought process. You know, kids want to do. Kids want to play basketball on grass. I don't believe that one bit. I have, I have never had that experience. I have never, ever, ever, ever in, in the places that I've been in the coaches that I know, I have never had a kid be like, well, if you will, if you, you know, if they ran a spread where they were throwing the ball, I would do it. I'm sure it happens. Um, I think that, you know, and sorry to hurt feelings again, there's probably some other issues. If a kid's saying, if a kid is saying, well, the scheme isn't what I want to do. Like, do kids transfer out of state championship programs that run the wing tee? Probably not much. Probably not much. No. Um, and, and and you see those teams be success uh, successful for years, right? right? Like, and I'm not saying it's never happened. You know what? You know what kids want to do? They want to win football games. I I 100 believe uh, kids want to win football games, and I don't think that that matters. I don't, I, I don't think how it gets done matters. Um, and there are exceptions. There are me kids out there, selfish kids. There are kids who are because of usually because of adults who are obsessed with getting their scholarship, but they're, they're the exception, not the rule. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I hear from coaches a lot. These kids don't want to win. These kids don't want to work. These kids lack focus. These kids, I'm going to tell you, 95% of that is on us. If, if you think your kids don't want to win, you need to do a little uh, inner searching, right? You need to do a little, you, you need to do a little meditating on that because if you think your kids lack focus, you need to, to take some time to look at what you're doing. You know, what are they trying to focus on? How long are they focusing? Right. You know, those kinds of things. Is your, is your playbook too complicated? Are you doing a piss poor job teaching it? Or you have one guy saying one word and another guy saying another word and you're confusing them. Or are you trying to teach them in a three hour practice? And yeah, they lack focus. I lack focus. At three hours, me too. <laughs> At hour three in the sun. You uh, look around. Oh, and I'm looking forward to conditioning later too. Also. Yeah. You look around. Okay. It's your coaching staff. If you're the guy who wants three hour practices, you look around at two hours. Look at every, take at, at one hour in. Now, if you've been doing this for too long, they're always going to look like this because they just know it's just, they're embracing the suck right now, right? The, there we go. Started Comes the episode circle. with it, and here we are. Yeah. Are the, we the best or what? But early in the season, do, do this early in the season because at least then they haven't fully embraced the suck yet. At 45 minutes or an hour, stop what you're doing and look around at your coaching staff. Not your kids. Look around at your coaching staff. How energetic they are, how engaged they are. 
and then look at them in two and a half hours. Look at actually, I'll tell you, what, look at them right at two hours, in about two hours and five minutes. And and I started noticing this that the energy from that coaching staff, the focus of that coaching staff, almost across the board, with the exception of the guy who's having fun. Like, if Oops. if you want to have a three hour practice or a two and a half hour practice. And I'm the offensive coordinator. I'm going to ask for offense to go last. My kids will be just garbage because they've lost focus. But I'm having fun because I'm calling plays, and that's what I like doing, and I've been waiting for two hours to do that, right? I'm out there, like, calling play. Now I'll fall apart eventually because my kids are not executing well because they've lost focus. But, like, I'll get into it, especially if you get into a real – when, when you're out there – um. This didn't happen at Amelia because when the the year there was a head coach because we were we were a ninety minute practice plan, um, but man we would get into the team and I would just I would just be just rolling and we'd put thirteen kids out there on scout team because um, we I mean we were really good we'd have thirteen kids running around out there on scout team and we're just calling whatever we want and we score jog down the field turn around twenty yards thirty yards score jog down the field it's just fun and everything you call works. That's a great feeling. And if I can do that at two and a half hours, I'm having a good time. The kids might even like that. Some of them, not the kids on scout team. Have Luckily, it, you know, we were doing this with 75 minutes into the practice and everybody's like, cool. And you're like, all right, bring it up. And they're like, oh, okay. So, and then I tell them to go to the weight room, but, uh, you know, we gotta do that. But... Ouch. I can't think of any other, I mean, the weaknesses of the pro is, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that the, um, Oh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you another weakness. I'll give you another weakness. I think you have to be more precise in your coaching to be decent, more precision, more detailed in your coaching of your blocking schemes with all those bodies in there. Yeah. Whereas I, I can spread you out, get the ball to an athlete somehow, Let block like trash, and you can't tackle me in the open field. Yep. No, I agree. And that we faced a lot of that this year is just that like there's not a hole. There's supposed to be a hole. There's no hole. What do you do? You go outside. Well, we just kicked a dude out there. Uh, that's not a hole. <laughs> we didn't really block the backside because it's not supposed to cut back. Um, yeah, I agree. That's, that's a weakness. Yeah. You've got to be, and I say that you can get to, and I say that you can get to a five and five level, right? To, we're not talking about, you just have some phenomenal athletes. I'm talking about, you got some average athletes. You can go five and five with a spread, with a crappy offensive line. You, that's the level that you can get to with a poorly coached offensive line. Right. So whereas if you have a poorly coached offensive line and a pro style, um, you might not win three or four games. You know, you, 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 your, your ceiling is much lower and it's going to look bad. Uh, but I say that in order to be an elite level spread team, you're going to have to be able to block unless you have some really dominant receivers and you can throw on timing uh and both of them if we don't have the offensive lineman we better be able to throw on time uh, and our offense is heavily based on timing especially with those with the drop back routes all right let's move into the last point here um and that's what should i run coach so i'm i'm, I'm a new oc or i've not been successful the last few years or a new head coach whatever there's more offenses than this out there, but even if it's spread versus no, don't do that. Where should we go? How should I pick? I mean, I'm biased and I'll say that the, the pistol power offense doesn't require pistol. It doesn't require power. It doesn't require any of those things. It's just an offense. And we have the versatility to do what we did this past year, which is play a lot in spread. Um, we dabbled in it in 2021. Uh, what year is this? 2023. We dabbled in it in 2021. We were spread heavy, but not all the time in 2022, um, but more spread than we had been in other years. Uh, we ran more, more bubbles, more screens. And, and um, you know, that was with, a, with an athletic quarterback who was developing his arm, uh, developing his accuracy. Uh, in other years, we've been 100% pro style, uh, you know, with tight ends always in there and the H backs always in there, except for, uh, you know, except for a few plays in, in years where we, you know, had some good playoff teams. Right. Uh, and they, we, we had a tight end in the game all the time. 
um, we have a lot of flexibility. I do see a value in the spread. Uh, if, you know, limited on players, I certainly can see, I can concede, like, I really need nine and preferably 11 good players. And you might be able to get to a certain level with seven, yeah. right? Seven well-coached offensive linemen uh, in the box or three good offensive linemen, a quarterback, a running back, and a couple of receivers that can threaten the edges, right? Or they can get, they can get you out of the box and, and make up for the fact that some of those guys can't walk. Um, we probably need eight or nine to be decent. Now, we and both offenses can do this, but within our system, we teach you how to do it. Coach your nuts off. And I can get it. I can get a below average kid to average. I can get an average kid to good. I can raise it. And I believe that. And that's why I like coaching. And I like coaching in this system. Um, I've never had offensive linemen who, you know, who were great across the board. I've had some good ones, but I've had, you know, we had to fill in spots like everybody else in, in small high school football and we just coach them up and, and we can get them to be tough. We can get them to be good. Maybe there's an advantage to if you just don't have any offensive line. I don't know how long you're going to go without an offensive line coach. Like if you're a head coach and you don't have an offensive line coach, like you're just like, I just can't find anybody who can coach offensive line. Guess what? That should be you then. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I don't in either one of them, but I, you know, I'll say like, like I could say like, yeah, if you don't have good offensive linemen, but that's me a cop out. Like I, I don't get great offensive linemen every year, uh, but we coach them. I could say if you don't have a good offensive line coach, but if you're the coordinator or you're the head coach, you need to go coach offensive line then. Um, you know, don't and if you're not good at it either. Get good at it. Join.joedanielfootball.com. Yeah. Check out the off offensive line coaching because – it's not that hard. <laughs> it's it's really not. It's really I committed not. to it two years ago, and I, I I'm there's better O line coaches, but if you follow what we time. do in the pistol power offense system, it's really not hard. It's first two steps. It's aiming point. It's and it's it's not attitude. We don't get on a sled. We don't get on a you know we don't do shoots. We don't do sleds. We don't do any of that stuff. It's very. Um, it's not scientific, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, we're not looking for tough, mean guys. You know, we're looking, for, it's like, if you get the aiming point, right. And you, you, you get to the right position on that guy and the timing is right on the play. Then we don't need you to block very well. Did you, you communicate? Know? Yeah. And, and execute whatever rule I have given you for for that situation it's 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 literally it's like, ask a it, it's ask a for offense right yes. ask on defense is alignment stance key read assignment and we talk about i don't have good words good letters for it if somebody could come up with this it'd be great but it's like what's your alignment supposed to be what's your stance okay and from an offensive line standpoint it's an 18 inch split it's a you know guards ear holes on the on the belt buckle of the center uh 18 inch splits across the board the stance is a three-point stance. Uh, I just prefer it greatly over two-point stance, even though I've played in both, tried both, thought two points should work, didn't work yep. uh, the way that I wanted it to. And, and I'm not a two-point stance coach guy, but it just didn't work the way that I wanted it to. They, they like it better in three-point stance, and I like it better in three-point stance. Um, something about the demeanor or something that just works better. But, you know, we get into a three-point stance, and then the key read becomes the aiming point, and it's that communication, who do I have and how do I get to him? And, and if you take the initial first two steps, you probably got some good plays and then you work on going off to the next level um, to where like that's, that to me is that the offensive line. And, and then, you know, guys are worried about all the pancakes and all that stuff. I don't care about pancakes because what I look for is effort and that's across the board. That's everything. And you don't have to be good to do this. We can, we we look for knockdowns. How do knockdowns work? In fact, they're harder against bad teams than they are against good teams because good teams pursue the football. And when a good football defense 
turns to pursue when a good football defensive player turns to pursue as the ball goes, you know, somewhere else and he's no longer engaged with me. I just keep running my feet and hope that, you know, he's got this little fly that causes him to tangle up and fall down. And that's what I want. Like, I don't want a pancake. I don't need to pick you up and put you on your back 10 yards down. I don't care about all that. Right. The blade is already gone. I just want yep. you to be annoying. Uh, it's, it's, it sucks. Um, yeah, players and coaches, maybe it's easier in a spread, but uh, you know, obviously to reach a to reach a high level in either one, you're gonna have to get good. And I've coached in places where we had reasonable success and did not have an experienced staff. Um, and again, I coached the offensive line as the offensive coordinator and as the head coach. Um, whoever's next has got, you know, the backfield. Uh, and, and then you, you figure it out. I, I think that, um, you personnel it, you know, we talk on defense all the time. Like it depends on what kids you have. That's how you should pick your defense. And I think on offense, the kids are there a little bit. We need to personnel what kids we have, but more than anything, it's the coaches. We're talking about O-line yeah. and, and as a head coach, you've got to come down and put, you got to coach O-line if it ain't good. But if you don't have a dude that can develop a quarterback and teach him, whatever method you want, right? We talked to uh, Dylan Terry a, a few, five weeks ago, whatever it was, and he talked about the R4 method. And If you don't have a guy that has an understanding of how quarterbacks should play football, you probably don't go to the spread. Because even if you're yeah. spread to run, they're going to load the box unless he can, at some point, hit those pass plays. So if you're just throwing your best athlete back there, that doesn't make him a quarterback. And now... Yeah, I really wonder the benefit of being spreading the ball and wanting to run it is different than these teams that we see that are in a spread but can't throw it. Right. I mean, legitimately can't throw it. Um, we played two teams this year that had, you know, had a well, one team, I guess, had an injury, had a great athlete who they put at quarterback, and we knew one thing about him. He couldn't throw. And <laughs> Do not rush but, the quarterback. <laughs> but they were a spread, and, and this, was, this was caused by injury. Uh, they had a backup who was like a young kid, and he could come in and throw, but he couldn't run the offense and, and threaten. Um, you know, he could, he could throw a hitch, and he could throw a fade or whatever, and this, this other kid couldn't do that. Um, but that was caused by injury. I would not want to be in that situation as, as my, you know, this is who we are. Right. But it seems to happen all the time. And I'll just say the, I, I hear maybe it's maybe, the, maybe the area guys that are saying this are like me with offensive line. I can coach guys up to be offensive linemen. I hear so many area guys saying like, anybody can run the area. Like you can find a quarterback and it's like, yeah, but you, you got to, you can, because you know how to coach them, right? I can find offensive linemen because I know how to coach them. Right. Uh, and I don't know which one I'd rather be. I don't, you know, I think I'd rather be able to make offensive linemen. And, uh, you know, I mean, I would figure it out. Well, it, here, you know, going back to previous episodes, we talked about sprint outs. Like, there's a way to change that launch point to where I don't need the best thrower in the world. And I also don't need the best O line in the world, but now I better have wide receivers. Yeah, that can catch need... every time the ball's in their area, and I better have a coach that can fill that role too. So if I lose that quarterback, I at least need to be able to roll out to a a, a spread side, whatever you know, the, the trip yep. side or the single side, whatever, and make a play happen. Um, if I don't have that O line coach or don't have the O line, so I mean, I, I think that's how you should pick it. You should personnel. What do you have in players? What do you have in coaches? And there's, I do feel like the spread it just requires more coaching. I mean, it, it, I, I think so. I, I, to an extent, but also if I have a really good quarterbacks coach and I have a good offensive line coach and I have a good receivers coach, but this staff only has three coaches on it, not having to coach an H and a Y, who are you know they, now I can I move our H's and Y's around like go with the receivers now, go with the offensive line now. We make that work, but it requires an extra you know requires extra planning to shuffle the H and the Y around it. But if I, if all I have is three coaches, you know, we've had times where the, the, the H Y coach is like, 
the young guy on staff who doesn't who's just seems learning. like it's always that and way. his job is to well no last year my hy my technically hy coach had four state championship rings um he'll be the office coordinator this year and he can coach circles around me um but you know what in his he's a spread guy and like there's something to be said for that too is what do you like and what do you believe in and if you like the spread and you believe in the spread if you don't like working with formations and you're like we're just going to line up in 10 and in 10 personnel if you want to go hurry up it's probably better suited in the spread um it, like if these things if if the idea of spreading the field and i don't know these guys have like I have the one offensive system that doesn't have like t-shirts and decoder rings and stuff like spread guys are like, Oh, 53 and third air. I saw a guy with that, like a hashtag air raid shirt on, uh, you know, like I don't have hashtag pistol power offense shirts. Uh, and I'm not going to, um, I say that maybe, but like the wing T guys and the, you know, they all have their, their, their clubs and everything. Uh, if if you like it, if it makes sense to you, um, that's that works. So, yeah. pick pick the one you like. Absolutely, coach. What you know? It fit last la, it fit last week, and it fits this week. All right, man. I think we've uh, we've checked all the boxes. We talked benefits, weaknesses, how to pick which one you should run. Um, both offenses, they both work. They're state championship yeah. offenses that run like either either one of these. With everything, right. So it's all about knowing what the, the good and the bad is and how you yourself should just go out and, and pick one. The biggest thing is don't dabble. I think pick something and go with it. Get good. <laughs> Get <Yeah>. better. <laughs> That's we're, we're facing a lot of that in uh, OU softball right now where we just made it to the championship series uh, this morning. So, you know, people complain and you just tell them get better. Well, yeah, you're, you're playing on the same rules as everybody else. Like That's right. If you uh, want to pay the bill, sir, and then we will uh, get out of here. Yep. Uh, if you want to check out JDFB Coaching Systems, just go over to join.jodanielfootball.com. You can access to five complete coaching systems, the uh, 425, the uh, the pistol power offense, which we talked a great deal about, but the 425 defense, the 3-4 defense system, the 4-3 defense system. And then as we go right now, um, about the time that this episode comes out, will be uh, module four of the 33 stack all updated for 2023 uh, is going to be coming out. And, and uh, right now we've done module one uh, on run fits. Things really, really good uh, for you to, you know, how to fit the run, how to use a 33 stack to defend the run. And then the, the, uh, here, the coverages, blitzes, everything's going to be coming out, the, the drills, the position groups. Uh, and then we'll be getting into um module five with, with your install plans, your practice, your practice plans, uh, everything that you need to, to make this thing go, uh, had a game plan for the offense or for the, with the defense and, and it's all there. This is the last system to get an update in the, this, we, we did 2020 updated the four, two, five. And since then we've done the four, three, the pistol power offense system and the three, four are all, uh, updated and ready to roll. So you can check it out by going to join dot get instant access, get in there, try it out, look around uh, and see what fits you. We've also got the chalkboard forum where you can ask questions of me anytime. We also have uh, every other week during the off season. And then as we get into in season soon, every week on Monday nights, a Q and a, where you can ask questions directly. We talk about it, we draw it up on a zoom and those are cut up and put up on the site. There's I think 600 or so uh, of those videos in there now that you get access to as well during the during this part of the year we have our q a's but we also do uh during may june july we do uh web clinics as well so we're doing a different clinic every uh every couple of weeks uh, we've done uh inside zone we've done defending tight end wing sets or defending that tight end wing twins formation that everybody seems to have gone to with the wing t uh we've, we've done some pretty pretty specific stuff and we'll continue working on those here through the rest of June and July, but check it out. Join.joedanielfootball.com. Awesome. Uh, I think that that clinic you did, uh, was it last week? It had to have been because it wasn't tonight. So um, with that tight end wing twins is that's, that's a really good, it's a great one to go. I mean, if you're a subscriber already, go check it out. If you're not, it's that I feel like it's worth signing. You're going to see that offense. 
right? Yep. And having an answer to it without having to waste a lot of time troubleshooting your current answer might, I think that's worth the price of admission there.